I told her the idea, thinking maybe we'll put a panel on at CR. And she came back a couple days later with initially a week-long event. It was very ambitious. And it was very inspiring to me to see that. But we whittled it down to three days. So I think this is going to be a really important conclusion to our time. First of all, the topic of this panel is about civic engagement, just the theme of the broad night tonight. So I want to invite Pete Blakemore, the dean of the executive dean of arts and sciences at CR. He's going to come talk to us first. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I'm sure. I do not like a professor's voice. I can project without this thing. So when Austin asked me if I would be willing to present about civic engagement. OK. Is that working? Let's get that. Is that better? Is that all right? My real job is being a tech woman. Thank you, Rabbi Steinman. So when Austin asked me if I would speak about civic engagement, I foolishly said, yes, sure. OK, Austin. I mean, I've known him for quite a while, and he's a wonderful colleague. And so I said, you know, what do I have to say about this? And I thought what I'd like to talk about is effective civic engagement. And since we're here and we're talking about this, and this is surrounding an extremely You can't hear me? All right. I'll use the microphone. How's that? Better? All right. I thought, yes, I'd be happy to help with a discussion of civic engagement. But then I thought, well, let's talk about effective civic engagement. And for me, one of the things that I'm an administrator now, but I was a college professor and university professor for some 34, 35 years. So for me, one of the things that I've always tried to teach students in my classes is the best thing you're going to get out of a college education is how to ask better questions. And so for me, I'm going to start with some elementary questions here. And the first one I'd like to ask you all, when we talk about, when we start to think about effective civic engagement, I would like, I'm going to try to put a bug in everybody's ear here tonight and ask people to think to themselves, when did you change your mind? Try to think of an experience of time when you had one position, maybe you had it for many years, and you were certain of that position, but then something happened in your life. You spoke with somebody. Somebody approached you in such a way that you changed your mind. Uh, and I think if we start from that perspective, because if we're going to talk about civic engagement, we also want to ask ourselves, towards what end? And so, I mean, right now, you know, as I said to Austin when, when he asked me about this, I said, we're not in the Middle East. I can't get in my car and drive to Tel Aviv to be in the middle of 100,000 people protesting against uh, brutal government. But we can do things here, and our own government is, uh, an important, is playing a very important, powerful role in what's happening um, right now. So um, just a little bit of background on myself. So, so that, those are a couple of questions that I would ask you. you know, when did you change your mind? Can you remember a time when you changed your mind? What was it like? How did that happen? Um, and and how, did, how did positions change for us? Uh, and then towards this, when you think about civic engagement, what is your goal? What do you want to happen because of your engagement? And now a little bit of background about me. I grew up in the 60s in New York. Um, so you can imagine, those of you who have any kind of historical knowledge, you would understand that I saw Broadway shut down by uh, 50, 60,000 people marching in anti-war protests. Um, I was living not far from where the Black Panthers marched in Columbia University, uh, with M1 carvings. It was a difficult time when young people tell me today, God, these times are so polarized, and life is so hard right now politically. And I think, well, things were a little bit like that in the 60s. Uh, and we remember it. I remember watching Walter Cronkite from Vietnam talk about during Tet that this war is unwinnable. And that radically shifted uh, the, the population, the United States population, towards its thinking about a war. So um, these are really important things. So, and in college, I worked on the divestment uh, against apartheid in South Africa. Some of 
you may realize that there was a movement that started in the 60s, but it really didn't take off until American college students really started to press. We built these shanty towns on campus. We, you know, I'm going to get into this about how, why that was effective, but uh, I did that. I was an environmental activist in timber towns for most of my life. Here, I taught environmental ethics. Austin teaches it now. I taught that here for 12 years. I taught environmental studies in Eugene, Oregon, another big timber town in Missoula, Montana. So, you know, getting into the middle of these kinds of issues where there's a question, where there are opposed, there seems to be opposition, um, has been, always been a very important part of my life. And I was also uh, the anti-racist uh, white professor with a bullhorn in the quad on a University of Wisconsin campus. So, I mean, I've participated in civic engagement my whole career. And, and so I totally understand people's need to get out and to protest and to be engaged. I think it's super important. Um, but I'm also a student of rhetoric and philosophy. And one of the things that I started to study more and more about this was this question of how do people's minds change and what is rhetoric. What is, you know, most of us, when we hear the term rhetoric, we think of it in that pejorative, you know. Oh, he threw a bunch of rhetoric at us and it was rolled us up, you know. Rhetoric is a bad thing, but that's not the way rhetorical theorists think about it. We know that what rhetoric really is, is simply the study of persuasion, of how do you move people through argument. You know, how does argumentation function in, in a community, in communication? And so, um, I'm just going to give you my own thinking about this. Two vital touch points are, on one side we had the platonic concept of rhetoric is cookery. This should be very, very apparent to most Americans today. When I say cookery, what I mean is, this is what Plato claimed through the mouthpiece that he always used of Socrates in the great work Phaedrus. He said basically to this young student who had come running to him with the sophists, uh, speech, you know, written out, and he and he said, "What do you, what have you got in your pocket? I've got this beautiful speech." And Socrates basically just says, "Look, rhetoric is just cookery. It's just you figuring out what people like to eat, what tastes good to them." And so that's all it is, you know. These sophists, you know, what you really want is the dialectic. You just have to do the dialectic all the time. And his own student, Aristotle, said, "No, no, no." Later said, "That's not what rhetoric is. Rhetoric is the act." of listening to what others who disagree with you about your perspective think, and then deciding whether what they are saying has any effect on the belief system, on the opinion that you hold. This is in a democratic, well, just, I'm using the air quotes here, sort of a democratic society, but you know, um, property owners did have the ability to vote. So when Athenians were arguing about whether to go to war or whatever, you know, Aristotle said what you have to do is listen to the others, the people who oppose you, and don't think of them as your enemies, but think of them as other members of your civic society who, are, who have their own opinions, and if you don't know why they believe and think about what about how they came to the opinion, then it's not, you're not going to be able to persuade them. And the beauty of that is also that when you start to listen to other people's ideas that are in opposition to your own, what you do is you start to compare and think about your own reasoning and your own rationale behind why you hold your position. Your position will become stronger based on listening to those who disagree with you. Okay, so this is a super important part of the, the kind of the dichotomy of the Platonic concept and the Aristotelian concept of what rhetoric does. Another great theoretician, Wayne Booth, in the 1960s, late 60s, when he saw the kind of headbutting that was going on among people who, would, who were screaming at each other in the streets, um, that's what it was like. Just so you know, it was it was, a, it was even more dramatic than it seems these days. We'll see what we'll see in the next few uh, months whether that happens again. But um, Wayne Booth said, you know, he he had this concept that of motivism, which is that if you start your argument, and by and when I say argument, I'm not talking about something that's violent or that's. Uh, uh, an attack on another person. An argument is a is really the way people like 
these philosophers that we're talking about, I'm talking about right now, think of it as it's the way to find out what people believe and why they hold those opinions. Okay, and Booth said if you look at somebody and you say based on their clothing, based on the button they're wearing, based on the hat that they're wearing, that you know everything already before you even begin to speak to them, you think that you know their motivations, you know their beliefs, you know all that. The, the, the real argument has completely shut down right from the start. So think about that. That's all I wanted. So can rhetoric be effective? Can rhetoric, can our thinking in these terms be effective? Well, I mean, I was just talking to Stuart, who's going to come up here in a minute, and, uh, and Austin. And obviously, if you're a Jew in 1935 in Austria and a Nazi comes up, you don't want to find out what they think. That's not what I'm talking about. Right? What I'm talking about here is what about a Palestinian today? Yes. 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 Would be the same thing. Yes. So you, 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 what you want to do is you want to find in this country you would want to find people who also may hold some of the same opinions that you do, or part, or you know, if you are trying to persuade more people to move in a direction, you have to listen to them. Right? You have to understand where they're coming from, and then compare that to what you're coming what your ideas are, and move in a direction where you can get some effective change. We have really good examples of times where civic engagement has helped to make change, to make positive change. The divestment that I talked about in the 1980s, the late 80s, some of you might even remember this, it was powerful and it worked. It really did. It was a major portion of the reason why the, the despicable government in South Africa finally collapsed and Apartheid was dis destroyed in South Africa. It was also Actually resistance, not, right. armed resistance right. that helped okay. out. Okay, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> What's that? I couldn't hear you. <clears throat> okay. She said something else after that. Okay. She just made the point that in addition, the major parts were armed resistance and community building from a space where rhetoric wasn't necessarily like the other person's opinion wasn't necessarily needed to justify. If the purpose was to dismantle a position where people's interpersonal power had so much, so much weight that the system was created around that. Undoing apartheid was about taking away the systems that held, that allowed people to have that individual power, just like we're speaking to racism now. We're not necessarily saying that we need to listen to other people who are not calling this a genocide. We're not, the That's rhetoric right. that, that you're talking exactly about. That was exactly what I said. The rhetoric about, that you're that talking my, about. That wasn't that my comparison by Natalie? No. You're I saying that you need, we need to sit and listen no. in a space. No, you didn't let me finish. Well, if we're having expert art, is there going to be necessarily someone who's going to be able to have another position on another side of the spectrum of this, another expert or something. We have another speaker coming up next. And it, that's going to give us another comparable position that we'll relates to some of the other people in the room. But you have, that's motivism. There you go. So we're gonna are you going to do the same thing that I'm doing right now? Okay. I promise. So, so let me, can I finish? It'll, I'm almost done. Okay. okay. Thank you. I really appreciate you letting me finish. Um, so, you know, uh, the other example that I would say is, and some of you around here will have very clear memories of this. Redwood Summer, um, 1990, Judy Berry, uh, brilliant, uh, thoughtful person, bringing forward an important argument where this is about Earth First, the Earth First movement, which many of you here will understand, and this was happening right here. I think Judy Berry was from Mendocino, but um, I think she was planning to start the Redwood Summer focus right here in, in Eureka, primarily. And what was that about? What Barry understood that others in Earth First who were motivists, who thought, I know what these people are like. And she said, maybe the loggers who are cutting down some of these trees would have the same opinions that I have. And she started connecting with them. And she was able to bring a coalition of people who recognized that the real power source was from outside of the community and that it was destroying an industry that might have been able to survive. but. I can tell you, I lived in a town where when the logging companies cut all the timber, this was the 1980s, we called it get the cutout. What they did was they closed the, 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 the mills. You know, if you cut the trees that are certain width and they have to retool, that's millions of dollars to retool when you're putting smaller trees through the mill. 
This is what happened in Missoula when I was there. Same thing started happening in Eugene when I was there. And it's probably why you see many, many of the mills going down around here too. So, so I mean, Barry understood that listening to what other people think and asking them why they believed the held that opinion made, it, made a coalition between loggers and environmentalists. That's powerful and that civic engagement that could be um, useful. So, I mean, I would say right now in this instance, maybe the thing to do is find out who in this country also is, has opinions that are close enough to where you are, where you can start to have some discussion with them and get them to move towards what we all really want, which is to stop the killing. Right? I mean, stop this madness. We want justice. And justice is a part of that, too. Yes. Yeah. For sure. So anyway, um, that's really all I had to say. Uh, <laughs> you know, build partnerships uh, here in this country to push our government towards in the direction that we want to be effective, to do effective civic engagement. And thanks. Just a moment.